The Depth to Delve Deep by Wilt Reiter. Chapter 72 The Last Straw Wilt gets directions as soon as the sun begins to shine. From the first booth to be opened in the train station that early morning, he boards a bus to the urban campground with his pack, some pot, and hatch. He's so tired. He hopes he doesn't end up doing what he does in Paris, spend the first night outside like a homeless person, and then spend the following day getting lost in a big old park looking for a campground. He ends up doing just that, but this time he can't find a campground. He's guessing it's in a similar sardine-like setting, squeezing in as many campers as they can alongside Ligenbold, the main park. His pack is wearing on him like a 500-pound ape just jumped on his back. After hiking for hours in the stifling heat through the park, even walking through private property on a periphery, he's had it. No luck finding the campground, he plops and drops down right where he is. He's not sure where he is, but if he hikes in enough off the path, he'll be out of view from others hiking the park. Now standing several hundred feet off the path, he's completely out of view, he thinks. Sort of sure with a sly that it'll be safe enough from any passerby. He sets up his sight just by simply laying out his bright orange garbage bag and then laying out his sleeping bag on top of it. It's so hot that he can't sleep in it, but the mosquitoes are so bad, he fears he will get malaria. His adoptive, his adoptive father gets malaria, as if starving and being a prisoner of war isn't enough. A mosquito makes sure his stay in hell is worse. He's unlikely to get malaria, but he's sure to be eaten alive. Bothered endlessly by the mosquitoes, he tries to sleep. It's hot and humid, and the horrible him and the mosquito is enough to make him mad. The heat is sick and stifling. He needs to stick his head out at least. He can't, but he wrestles with the heat. The hell of it, all well into the afternoon and through the night. Roat fitfully tries to get some sleep, and just when he finds deep sleep, he is rudely awakened. Someone is kicking his feet. He can hear and sense someone standing over him. He's too tired to care. He just doesn't want to be bothered. He hopes whoever it is will just go away. The kicks keep coming. Rolt looks up through the opening in his sleeping bag at the person who kicks him. The person standing there seems so sanctimonious as he sneers. There's one thing Rolt dislikes. It's people who think they have a right to be disrespectful to others. You can't come to camp here. Why not? You can't come here. Because you're not allowed. Why not? You can't camp here because you're not allowed. Because I work here. I stay here. Oh. I wrote surprised how the first words coming out of this Dutchman's mouth are English. It seems everywhere in Europe where English isn't the first language ends up being the first language spoken. I wrote it's in no mood to have this guy stand around gawking at him while he's lying on the ground. He's already kicked Road a couple of times. You can see he's an employee of the park. Still, kicking a dog is... A bit dangerous, as Rolt recollects an old cliche, something about letting sleeping dogs lie. He gets up, and all he wants to do is kick back, but he holds back and asks him how he spots him. I saw your bright orange bag. Rolt responds, you know, kicking someone while they're down isn't a good thing to do. But it's disrespectful. Rolt can tell by the Dutchman's dumb look that it's not seen sinking in. He would like to kick his head in, then bury him in, the, in his bright orange garbage bag, but even then Rote's not sure it'll sink in. Rote rolls his sleeping bag and places it and his bright orange bag inside his backpack. He wishes to not have pulled out that bloody bright thing. Where is the campground? Right past where my wheelbarrow is. Follow it. Five minutes later, Rote's in the campground, and like all bad habits, he tries to walk on by past the campground gate. Unfortunately and fatefully, a security guard stops him. He's just finishing his tour of duty from the night before. He lets Rote in, but says he needs his passport to hold on to until the campsite is paid for. Rote gives him his driver's license instead. He doesn't want to part with his own piece of identification, letting him back into his own country. Country calling him now night and day. Come home. Come home. The security guard is a bit, a little bit ticked. A bit ticked. It's obvious by Rote's accent that he's from across the Atlantic. He should have had a passport. He tells Rote to come and pay for his site when the office opens at 9 a.m. He also tells him there's a three-day minimum paid stay. Rote can afford it. It's only seven euros a night. Unfortunately, he's still stuck in the survival mode. He's so used to sleeping outside for free that 
He's not ready to change. Beyond that, he doesn't really want to change or sleep in an overstuffed campsite. But since he's not allowed to sleep in the park, he's given no choice. All the hostels and hotels are booked. He finds a spot on the edge of yet another sardine can. This one is stuffed to the gills with people and tents. Fortunately, the RV is unallowed past a certain point. He pulls out his sleeping bag and thinks that's not enough. It's still early enough in the morning that most of the people are still sleeping, though. Some are up and about already. It's long, long before rope rolls in there and is high again. Seems the first thing most of the campers just waking do is smoke, too. Seems Italians really like the camping for like Bois de Boulogne. Majority of the campers here are Italian. Another thing about most is similar to Amsterdam's answer to Paris's Bois de Boulogne municipal campground are the washrooms. They're filthy. They force everyone to squat like an animal. Where's the seat? Every stall is the same way, with no seat on to sit on it. To sit on. It's the same in the women's toilets. Broke leaves the facility spreading his next need to return. He walks to the back section of the campground, near to the edge where there's a hedge. He sits down on his sleeping bag with his back resting against his backpack. He sees tents of various sizes and shapes staggered all over. It makes him think, why the hell haven't I bought a tent? He soon forgets. It takes him a while to walk around all of Amsterdam. He does so so stone 90% of the time. And now that he has, he's had enough. He's had the unfortunate sight of seeing people feeding on French fries more than mayonnaise. He's seen Dam Square, the Rembrandt Spleen, and Westerkirk, the highest tower in Amsterdam where Rembrandt is buried. He's seen in the distance while on a bridge crossing one of the oldest canals, Oud Sidsburgla. It's the dome of Oud Kirk or Old Church of St. Nicholas or Sinterklaas, better known as Santa Claus. Broach sure he passes by where Anne Frank hides from the Nazis in Amsterdam while writing in her diary. She's eventually captured and confined to die a year later of typhus after surely suffering at Belsen concentration camp. Roe learns that even though Holland, like many other countries occupied during World War II, without much of a fight, do resist like the French with their resistance. Queen Wilhelmina grants the people of Amsterdam the use of her motto on Amsterdam's coat of arms for their conduct during the occupation, while her re wealth and wares, like herself, are whisked safely to Britain. Helflag, Vesta Braden, Barnhartel, Heroic, Resolute, Merciful. Roe's tired. Yet he still finds things to learn. One thing he can, can't seem to figure out is why in such a big city there are only two apparent bank machines. He takes out enough euros to first find and purchase the tent and some much needed shoes. He's paraded through Paris's most well-to-do areas and shoes no better than two tape flaps. And he's still wearing them all over Amsterdam. It's time to try on some new shoes. He's tired of being shunned. He thinks of the old Scottish proverb. It is better to wear out shoes than sheets. He wears those these shoes worn long before he comes overseas. Even then they flip-flop with each step. And to think of all the mileage he's put on them since. He's easily walked several hundred miles through Scotland, several hundred more through Ireland, and even more through England, and now France and the Netherlands, and say for the last two, mostly in the pouring rain. His shoes are literally like rags, duct tape to his feet. Yet he's not about to pay the outrageously high costs found here in Amsterdam as in Paris. He finds a pair he likes in Paris and would have bought them immediately if his size had been in stock. In lieu of that, he ends up getting a much needed haircut in Paris. Back at the campground, he figures he'll just pack up and go to Amsterdam's Schiphol or Schiphol Airport to see if there are any cheap flights back to his country. Meanwhile, he's dismayed. He runs into a problem trying to get his ID card from cashiers at the campground. The problem is the cost. Nonetheless, hands the 21 euros owed for the three nights and grabs his card before heading to the airport. There he checks out the many airline booths and, just for fun, he looks into flights to Adu. They'll fly anywhere affordable, but affordable flights are hard to find in the summer. He feels he might have to wait for the fall before he can afford a flight home. The difference is in the thousands. Still in a skiffle Roach sees a sign behind an abandoned airline carrier counter. He recognizes it immediately as one of the chartered airways in his own country. The small sign behind the counter is promoting a very affordable fare back to his home country, just not with the same city he departs from. It's still a cheap fare, 400 euros. Ro 
Lord takes note of the day of the week that departs. It's not today. He's just guessing after being faithful. It seems like a week. But it might be t tomorrow. He asks around the other counter counters to see what day it is and soon finds the flight will leave the day after the following one. He heads back to the campground with the final plan. Buy a tent. If there's one thing he's not going to leave without, it's, it'll be a tent. Something he should have had from the start, along with better shoes, even a better backpack, backpack neither borrowed nor, nor begged. And who knows, if he has a tent, he just might want to continue traveling. He finds a tiny tent for a reasonable price and packs it into his backpack. He heads back to the urban cow camp. Road avoids the afternoon staff, bypassing the gate. He sets up his tent. The campground issues metal signs, a, a little smaller than the license plate to each tent. It's mandatory to put it on the tent in a visible manner. This tent shows no sign, and it sticks out no matter how small his tent is or green. Just as much as his tent is the only one with a sign. He knows every tent in the sardine can must show a sign. They all do, save his. The sign denotes the day they arrive and the duration. Road had been assigned one on his earlier stay, much to his dismay. And with nowhere to attach the placard, he places it on his begotten backpack. He since submitted it to retrieve his driver's license. On top of that, there are other stipulations. The submission of a person's passport is a prerequisite. Campers, no matter how many sleep at each tent, must hand in their passports. Then there's a minimum stay of three days. The fee, the fee for camping will be paid before any passport is returned. Road bypasses all these stupid stipulations as someone else's problem. They're not his. He'll continue with his wild ways. Road thinks about it after he sets up his tent. He knows he's sometimes stupidly stubborn, but not this time. He's not about to return to the front desk and submit his passport. He figures he can get away with it for one more night at least. He figures wrong. He's forgotten how aggressive the night watchman had been with him the first morning he enters. In a very threatening tone, he says to Rope, If you don't go to the front desk and register when the office opens up, I'll hunt you down. Rope does. But he's, but he's since generated the need to re-register again. That's a week or so ago. Oh no, three days ago. He remembers these things. He's been stoned since. He'll brush it off. An errant thought. He believes he can escape detection one more night for him. The more he heads to the airport. He's so stoned. He's already forgotten that the flight leaves the day after the next. So what does he do? He smokes some more hash, settles in for the night in his brand new tent. In the wee hours of the morning, he hears a loud shout. An angry and aggressive security guard gestating like the Gestapo. Flashes his light through Rogue's tiny tent and shouts while shaking his tent. Where's your number? Where's your number? Where's your number? I'll pay in the morning. Rogue's so tired and still stone, he doesn't want to, this intrusion to continue. But it does, and how? The security guard is livid by the lackadaisical response and starts to kick the tent. Rogue's tent is tantamount to a body bag. But that doesn't stop this big, burly Dutchman. What's up with the Dutch, thinks Rogue. Relentless with this righteous indignation. Give me your passport. Give me your passport. Give me your passport. No. I'll pay in the morning. The security guard comes angry. Then he's not ready to explode. He screams. Give me your passport. Rote flares up. Fuck off. I'll leave now. Rote unzips the flap that forms the side of his tiny tent and crawls out. He can feel the heat of the flashlight on his face. It's inches away. He turns away, blinded by the light. He stands up and turns his back on the dangerous Dutchman. Rode ignores the guard and, and readies to leave. With back turned and bent, he reaches into the tent. The security guard isn't so ready for him. The security guard snaps. He goes absolutely apeshit on Rode. He hits the back of his head with the flashlight, knocking him down to the ground, shouting, Give me your passport! Give me your passport! Give me your passport. And as he shouts over and over again with the same disdain, he punches and kicks Rote, who's doing his best to block each punch and roll from each kick. Rote's in disbelief and shows it in the way he says, Hey! 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 And the security guard senses or sees the way Rote protects one particular hand pocket. He reaches and tries to put his hand into the protective pocket. Rote, bent on his intent, rolls away and stands up. 
and in a moment of no mistake, lets the security guard know with no more than a look. The security guard is stunned, now a bit taken off guard, but he's still determined to take something. He reaches inside Wilt's tent and grabs his backpack. He leaves with it, saying, You must pay for three nights. Wilt knows he's only been there one night, maybe two, but definitely not three since he bought his tent. He's disheveled and dirty from the nail he got. The other way is okay. It was somewhat ticked at what just happened. He brushes off the bad experience and begins to take apart his tent. He still has that, the sleeping bag and the clothes he sleeps in. The security comes back without his backpack and says almost in a conciliatory manner, you can pick up your backpack in the morning at the office. Will nods an acknowledgement but refrains from saying anything. He's wrong. He was somewhat relieved at being to be rid of the backpack. Meanwhile, the security, security guard lingers a bit, hoping for a peace offering, though none will be coming. With his tent in one hand and his sleeping bag in the other, Roe leaves the campground, though not before consoling some concerned campers. He's all right. He heads out and hangs around the adjacent park until dawn. He's getting angrier by the hour. When the campground opens, he comes back and has a word with the owner of the sergeant major. He's even worse in his words, for after an earful from Roe, he begins bunk bumping up the price of what Wilt will have to pay if he ever wants to get his seized backpack back. If he gets those three nights stay prerequisite, he thinks because he's only been there one, maybe two nights, and that's all he should pay, especially in the way he's being forced to leave. Wilt really thinks he's being ripped off. It's just a stupid rule. Wilt remembers way back when he forecasts his future. He tells his fellow convict crew he'll be kicked out before he ever leaves Europe. Here he is. With an added bonus, he can leave his bothersome backpack behind. What a load off his back. Literally, leave it. He leaves the campground without it. Roth's autobiographical book, along with the discs and his little black book, are buried at the bottom of it. A two-page printout of the first eight years of his life in the form of a yellowing document, the only legal record of his fosterage, a form that finds him in the far north of his country after requesting it over 20 years ago. It's also in the back. That's not all. The words written on a greeting card holding a picture of his biological mother taken a few months after she gives birth to him is buried at the bottom of it. He leaves it all behind and heads to the airport with a tent in one hand and a sleeping bag in the other. On the first time in his life, he feels freedom. <laughs>